Word had gotten back to me through the grapevine that Buster, my estranged trainer, had returned to the back alleys of Beale Street, where I had first met him over a game of cards. I briefly considered heading east to track him down so I could apologize for ignoring his advice on our Philly rigid mind. The advice that, had I listened to, she still may be running us to easy money this very day. The sweet girl. She was the one who had put in her heart and soul, lifting my soul to heights I hadn't imagined possible to experience. But with our glorious winning streak in the distance of our rearview mirror, I'm left to simply enjoy the company and good grace of the sweet beast. There will be no pressure to win for her until next racing season. She can relax for now and enjoy a celery stalk and consider the universe. I thought back on my first season and realized, even though I was in a slump, I did in fact have a remarkable run. No, I couldn't track down Buster just yet. Instead, I send a letter to Memphis and ask one of my contacts there to pass it around the back alley card games until it finds its way to Buster. As the season is about to close and I have just one last race to run, this will be my final chance to salvage some winnings. And so I enroll our Colt in his last race of the season. With Fortuitous Creek inexplicably missing, I'm not able to place a covert wager, but perhaps it's for the best. I had given up my career to take up owning racehorses for the chance to ride my way down the road to prosperity, and this race would be my last pure attempt at that. But first I had to set things straight. If I was going to have a shot at it in the saddle, I would have to have a clear and satisfied mind. So in the small amount of time left before the race, I headed to the beach. Mistaking me for a door-to-door -door salesman of some sort, which apparently he's very fond of, the oracle is far more welcoming than I had expected. He offers me a Capri Sun and immediately asks to see some of my products. Well, have at it! Let's take a look at your worldly wares and exotic tchotchkes, hmm? After the disappointing discovery that I am not a salesman, he's caught off guard with the revelation of my true intentions. I have something for you, I say, handing him the gaudy bauble. The same golf ball that Getty had handed me when I lost my own while playing with him in his emerald swamp. The totem which carried the curse of the phantom jockey which Getty had ordered the oracle to concoct, perhaps in this very seaside cave we now sit. The phantom jockey who tormented my psyche on the racetrack and played no small part in the devastating losing streak I now find myself entangled in. I want you to remove the soul of Hampton Motley from this golf ball and return it to his body. I order him. You hold no authority over me, he says, casting a crooked pointed finger at me. Which is a true statement. Hillary Getty is his boss but I know his vice. When Creek told me about the Oracle, he explained him as a horseman, a horseman and a seventh dimensional soul mage. So I start telling him about the track and one race in particular that's coming up. And that I, in fact, have some inside info on said race. After all, I'm an owner and rider with a filly set to run in it. With each word that spills from my mouth, the oracle's gambling appetite becomes wet with excitement, and shortly, he's salivating at my proposition. I don't get out as much as I'd like to, being bound to this cave as I am by Getty's magical tether. I would relish the opportunity to, perhaps, have you place a few small wagers on my behalf. I agree to place a bet on a high dollar trifecta wager in exchange for the release of Getty's curse. With that, the oracle performs a small ritual in which he extracts the phantom jockey from the golf ball and imbues a betting slip with the trapped soul. He hands me the slip while laying out the final terms. Here is my betting slip imbued with the soul of your friend. 
Upon this trifecta of horses winning, I am to turn in his betting slip in exchange for the winnings, and the curse will be lifted when the betting slip is destroyed. Upon agreeing to the terms, he bids me adieu. Break a leg! <laughs> It's clear skies in Atlantic City with a fresh sea breeze pushing the smell of salt water and fried oysters across the racetrack. As they load us into our starting slots, I inhale deeply and let a smile spread wide. We've drawn the number one slot and will have a slight positional advantage if we can keep a fast pace. Ready? The buzzer pops and the pack explodes, tearing up the track hooves and thunder. The pack quickly surges ahead of us, yet I maintain our position against the rail, just letting frugal power run his natural pace. There's a lot of open real estate ahead of us, and it should be a green light to gain some ground, but something is holding us back. I feel a heavy weight, the sensation of a lead sandbag resting in my hip pocket and growing heavier and heavier with every stride. Frugal Power seems to sense the handicap sensation as well, as I can feel him heaving with great power, yet we gain little ground on the pack ahead. The weighted sensation emanates from my right hip pocket, the very location which holds the Oracle's betting slip, now imbued with the cursed soul of the Phantom Jockey, and the Phantom is working hard again at ensuring we lose this race. For by us placing outside of the top three finishers, the Oracle will likely hit his precious trifecta bet and will win. I can envision him now, in his yes. seaside lair, yes. watching with intent no. through some magical portal yes. and riding the fantastic emotional Buster. roller coaster Buster. every yes. gambler is on yes. when their horses seem Yo, to be lining man. up for a win. Yeah. Having glanced at his betting slip prior to the race, I saw the trifecta of horses he picked to win, and peering ahead now through the piercing wind, I see they are in fact amongst the leaders of the pack. The furlongs are drifting by, and if I'll have a chance to bust the oracle's trifecta, we'll have to make our move now. With the final furlong slipping past, I call on Frugal Power for all he's got, and to my surprise, he surges. Keeping him close on the inside, we race ahead, gaining ground, moving halfway through the pack of racers, leaning inside, hoping to find a window of light to dart through, but there is none. The finish line whizzes past, and I know we finished outside the top three. Even so, I feel so dang proud of the strong colt carrying me. Frugal Power made a heroic effort, with little to no training, and I'm grateful to him for that. When I look up to the board above the grandstands, it confirms what I already know. The Oracle hit his trifecta. After losing, I pack up Frugal Power and leave the racetrack, passing right by the betting windows. I'm not ready to cash in the slip yet, for when I cash in the slip and deliver the money to the Oracle's cave, it will release the soul of the jockey back to his master, where he'll surely be assigned to haunt the next wayward rider who crosses Getty and denies his stud fee shakedown. Sure, I'd be free to ride again, but there is something that just doesn't sit right with the whole bargain. About a week after the race, I'm cleaning up some tack, prepping to put Rigid Mind on her winter vacation, when Buster shows up with the letter. I apologize for my foolishness from the bottom of my heart, and to my relief, we're able to bury the hatchet beneath a tranquil and deep stream of water under the bridge. We break bread and I catch him up on my misadventures, buying frugal power and succumbing to Getty's ghost discovering Buster's sordid past with Getty and trying to strike a deal with the Oracle to set it all straight. Finally, struggling to win but falling just short. I then show him the betting slip I had yet to cash in, and we share a chuckle thinking about how raw the Oracle must be since I have yet to show up with her payment. Buster then shares with me his own remorse at never being able to set the events right from the card game that went so wrong that fateful night. Then, with a twinkle in his eye, he suggests there's more than one way to shoe a horse. He then lays out his plan. When I hear the details, I'm caught off guard with his requests, 
as it would involve me committing damn near the gravest mortal sin a gambler could do. To welch on a bet is to not pay what you owe after losing. This act can be expected to be met with wrath from the parties scorned. So after Buster states that part of his plan involves me handing over the betting slip to him, it leaves me pondering if indeed Buster has been bitten by that insidious green snake of greed. For if I did this, it may not be welching, but it would certainly be welching by proxy and would forever tarnish my reputation in the world of the gambler. Not just that, but I'd be welching on an interdimensional soul mage, and thus, I'd have to expect a fierce and cruel retribution to be directed my way. But the simple fact is, I do trust Buster, and I'm not a gambler anymore. I'm an owner. I'm a rider. And with that, Buster suggests we take a little road trip, down south, towards the Del Mar racetrack. 62 miles, six motels, and 12 greasy palms later, we're let into the dark, dank room housing the catatonic jockey Hampton Motley. And there he is, just slumped over in his seat, switch in hand, playing round after round of jackbox. And all we hear is silence, periodically pierced by the game's sneers. Buster withdraws the betting slip which confines Motley's soul. He hands it to me, and I tear it into fine pieces. I cross the room and I let the confetti fly. From out of nowhere, the phantom jockey materializes, strutting across the threadbare carpet and resuming its rightful place inside the vessel it calls home. Hampton sets down the switch, his eyes animated with life, and he yearns for vengeance for the days he's lost. Take me to Getty. I seek his skull. But Buster simmers him down, suggesting the best place for him, for all of us to settle our scores, is the only place it really matters, on the racetrack. Knowing we'll likely be facing heat from Getty, and more directly a blowtorch from the Oracle, we need a spot to lay low till the next racing season starts. Buster suggests his sister. She's got a cozy little farm up north that she uses for breeding horses, he tells us. She would be able to house rigid mind and frugal power in her guest quarters, and the three of us could bunk in the barn. So here we are, a ragtag team of horsemen, all looking towards our next ride. We're not a busted trifecta, but rather a trifecta forged.